This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Well, today I have a, uh, a guest who I've known for a few years, and I was thinking back to the first time that I met Charles Faulkner, and I was in an event uh, with Charles Faulkner and Ed Sakota, and I believe it was early 2001, and somehow or another today it's 2012, and I'm not sure what I've done for the last 11 years, but uh, I don't know where time has gone, Charles. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, you're welcome. I got a, a couple of books on my shelf as some evidence that you've been doing some stuff. Yeah, I guess that's where it all went. Actually, three as I think about it, yeah. Only three? There's four. Man, I got to get you four? the fourth one. There's something missing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, listen, let, let me let me just kind of give a broad overview for folks. Um, you know, Charles was originally in uh, Jack Swagger's Market Wizards series. I believe it's the new Market Wizards, right, Charles? Yes. And uh, both of those first two Market Wizards books, I think people consider classics. And I think that's where Charles was was first introduced. And I'm going to let him go into a lot of the details. But as, as this broad overview, Charles is a, has had an expertise in something called neuro-linguistic programming. And that would be one of his expertises. But I, I think from my perspective, Charles has probably affected me more than anyone else in the sense of how he looks at human behavior, how he looks at the mind. And he does this from just an, you know, an everyday approach, but he also has this, this unique niche where he approaches the trading world um, from the human perspective. And he's got some great insights. And uh, like myself, Charles has had a chance to interact with some of the great uh, traders over the years. And he's just been exposed to a lot of different thoughts and has developed his own uh, way uh, it, it looking at the mind and behavior and all these different subjects we're going to talk about today. And I, th I think one of the first things I wanted to talk about, because I just thought it was an interesting, maybe kind of a broad overview, Charles, would be um, the idea of maps. You know, it's such a simple thing. You know, as kids, we all, you know, I remember trying to draw the map of the 50 states. And I used to be able to draw the map of the 50 states in like fifth grade or something by by memory. And you just a little tiny you know, vignette, but talk to me about maps and how you see maps and feel free to be as detailed as you want and maybe start people off genderly with, and, and then kind of move through the progression of how you use maps and think about maps. Well, <clears throat> yeah, they call them maps or Charlie Munger calls them mental models. Uh, different people have different words, words for this idea that when we think about something, we make uh, some sort of a picture of it, if you will, and we now know enough about connectivist psychology that part of it's a picture and part of it is our number of associations. So if you think of a dog, for example, then you get some kind of an image of a dog and maybe it's your dog and maybe it's just the dog's head and then you think about how soft and friendly the dog is or maybe some other memories and so forth. And these these show up in our experience and not, not only visual, but in all sorts of ways for anything that we think about, and particularly anything we want to make sense of. So you think about the United States, and you, as a kid, could quickly draw the map of the uh, continental United States, and you probably knew Alaska was up a certain way, and, and Hawaii is over a certain way, the same way that people are thinking of that right now as I'm explaining it. Well, okay, fine. What difference does that make? Well, it all depends. It's like we have a, a mental map, if you will, of how a car works. And the parts of it that we directly, most of us anyway, connect with, putting the key in the ignition and which pedals and how many and how you steer, we have a very vivid map of that. And it corresponds to actually our car and so forth. But as you get under the hood, you know, unless you're a mechanic or, you know, a, a weekend car guy or something, that it gets a bit fuzzier, if you will. It's it, We have like, okay, there's little explosions going on and there's things whirling around and we have a sense of that. And some people have more or less detailed maps of that. And so when we're understanding something, whether it's how a car works or how the electricity comes into our home and flick a light switch, all we care about is flicking the light switch. 
But as you get into more and more complicated situations, this really curious thing happens. And and this I'm, I'm going to mention him right at the beginning. And Daniel Kenman and his colleague, colleague Amos Tursky came up with this idea about what they call System 1 and System 2. And System 1 is our quick, intuitive thinking that utilizes these images and utilizes our feelings and, and makes sense of things. We can react and biologically, hugely advantageous. We're glad our ancestors had this skill so they could we could be here today. And then over those millennia, another system developed, uh, the system two, the second more thoughtful, deliberative, let's think things through system developed. Now, here's the thing, is the map making starts with that intuitive, quick understanding picture of the world that we get. And very often, you read their work, you find out we don't get much beyond that. And a lot of life, that's just fine. You know, you, you go into a restaurant and you say, I'm going to order a steak. And you haven't ever been in the restaurant before, but you know what a steak is. And you order it and it comes back and it's not exactly how you pictured it, but eh, close enough, you know. And if it's not close enough, we send it back, you know. So we have these, these ways of dealing with this. You get into something like trading and the person's map, their mental picture, the model they're applying to what's happening out there as they're making a trade, now it begins to make a pretty big difference and a lot of people are really unclear what it is that's going on out there. But as these two scientists, researchers pointed out, the less information we have, the quicker we'll make up an image and a story that makes sense to us and we'll believe it. Well, that can be, I guess I could look at that immediately as being good and bad. Exactly. It, and it's, it's great because when things are close to us in time and space and physicality, then this, works, this system works really well, like driving a car, for example. You know, we're responding to the world. We have ideas what other cars will do and so forth. You know, and, and even then, of course, we, we know there's a good deal of slippage given how much accidents there are. But, but it does work. But as you go more into you know, what's the person's trading approach, what, what map do they have of what's happening out there in the markets, and therefore, how does that inform? their trading decisions, well then, because of either the shortness of time, which is just subhuman in how fast it is, or more like the trend follower, the extended length of time, which is something that a lot of people have a hard time holding on to, then those kinds of natural systems fall apart. That is, they're not as effective unless the person has been careful in how they built their map. Or model, if you will. You know, Charles, as I think about right now today, we, we've got the, the Dow is uh, hovering around 13,000, crossing back and forward. And, uh, you know, I've noticed a lot of headlines in the last couple of days. I think Time Magazine, is this rally for real? And you're seeing a lot of desire to attach um, feelings of well being and good times are around the corner. And, it, it, it's kind of where you're going with where you're, where you're building a map. I mean, maybe people are building a map about what it means for the Dow to be going back above 13,000. But that doesn't, I think that gets back to your second part, it doesn't necessarily translate to trading success. It's, well, and, and take the point that even as it's going over 13 again, there's another whole emergent group of people who are saying, but the Dow is now disconnected from the economy that in the old map that people had, the two would grow together. And they're saying, well, now they're not, you know. And, and so it's like, how does one revise the mental map? Now, to back up a moment, if this seems, you know, too space age for people, is that you can't not do this. That's what all the research is coming out now. And this, I don't know if it, the, your, your listeners have heard about the the book about the invisible gorilla where these uh, college kids are playing uh, basketball and people watch a video and they're supposed to count the number of times that the balls pass between the players in the white shirts. And in the middle of this video, out walks uh, a person in a gorilla suit, beats their chest a couple times and then walks off. And it's about seven seconds in the middle of the video. And the people who are concentrating on the passing of the basketball from one team to another, remember, 50% of them will not see the gorilla. This is the vision is selective and vision is active. And the vision that we're using in the real world, if you will, is based on what map we're projecting. So it does make a difference about about which maps you're using and and do you have systems to update them? 
it, it, it quickly becomes, I think when people hear you, I, I hope they, they, they immediately get those, 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 those aha moments where it's like, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to put my money on the line, yeah, it, it's not just about rolling the dice. It's not just about how you felt that morning eating the cereal that, you know, you can have those thoughts. You can have those quick, immediate, intuitive thoughts, but they might lead you astray if you've not taken it, as you say, getting under the hood and, and really seeing how the pieces interconnect, that you can really, you can have big problems if you don't take it the extra step. Well, and it, again, this all depends on, you know, what what's your level of interaction? You know, it's like, I don't need to know very much about electricity to run a light switch, right? But then again, I'm not concerned about that. But then if I do get concerned about the flow and all that and how the flow might make a difference in my trade, like liquidity flow, then suddenly it does make a difference. And so it isn't about having to learn everything, but it is about realizing that your natural tendency, especially with little bits of information, is to build a picture in a story and go, ah, and the thing is you feel congruent as we say it feels good it feels familiar and you know it could also be as you say completely misleading and it's like the intuitions of a very experienced musician about what's in there are really different than the intuitions of an inexperienced one or we have this show called car talk here on saturday mornings and these guys hear people describe you know their car making a certain noise when it goes up or down a hill or something and they can infer what that means because they do have a rich map of lots of different cars and what sounds do what and so on and so on and then they ask questions and tests they go well does it do it when you stop does it do it before you know right after you turn off the cars is still doing it and they have these other ways that they're testing the limits of their knowledge knowing that they have an incomplete map picture or or model you know charles was uh i put him he's actually wrote the foreword for my trend following book and he was in my most recent book the little book of trading and i believe the chapter title is called in the moment of now and it's i don't want to say this because i don't want to sound trite because i'm not that studied but it's it's a it's a zen like expression to be in the moment of now and charles says whatever you could define being in the moment of now and then maybe bring it back and circle it and connect it to being in the moment of now when it comes to being for example uh, in Ed Sakota or a David Harding or a Salem Abraham or a Bruce Kovner. And so you know, kind of define the moment of now and then maybe bring it back to how it applies in the world of some of these traders that you and I know. Well, yeah. And I, first, I'm going to start by uh, misquoting or attempting to quote uh, Nassim Taleb uh, from the Black Swan. And there's a phrase in there that I love that goes something like, the more people understand the past, the more they think they can predict the future. Which is, a, yeah, you know, the, the past is the past. It's gone and we don't know the future. All no, we have is right the, now. But here's the point is that we have within us, again, the, the new neurobiology coming out. The work is saying we can't help if we put two ideas next to each other to think they're somehow connected, to think they're somehow causal, to think that this leads to that, leads to the next thing. And so that the line from... Um, Talib is the idea that we have the past is prologue to the present. So the present must be leading to some particular future. This in, in uh, behavioral finance is known as the hindsight bias, meaning that I think that I saw how this happened and therefore I know what's going to happen next. So being in the moment of now in the simplest non-Zen way of thinking about it is not to reference the past or the future. That's, not that's make tough, isn't it? That's tough. You've seen that in people. Well, yeah, no, it's, it's against our nature. This is right. years ago uh, that I, uh, when I heard the line, and I heard it from Larry Height, so I don't, he may be the original author, I don't know. It's, um, cut your losses, let your profits run, and it's the hardest thing to do. And I began to think about that line, given my own background, and I went, you're going against biology. It's a, I mean, that's where I tell guys, I says, you earn your money. You know, people who say, oh, you're, you're speculators, traders, it's not that hard. Say, oh, no, you have to go against human nature and not do the, oh, I know what's going on story. 
you're going, there's a probability of this, and it's a good enough probability, and I have enough evidence of the pattern that I'm willing to put a measured bet on. But you're not doing, oh, the more of the past I can explain, the more of the future I know is going to happen. Yeah, but you just, you just really, we could go on for hours when you say, well, examine the probabilities and put a measured bet on. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's the, if there's a secret sauce, it might be right there in that simple phrase, <laughs> you know, that's, that's heavy duty lifting for most people when they haven't been exposed to these worlds. But the first thing about it is to get that your brain is designed to fool you. And the thing is that in the past of our creature in our in our history is that the idea of something was coming towards you at great speed you know whether it was an ox cart or what your ancestors that predicting that that was going to run you down and getting out of the way was a really good idea and so in fact one definition of of intelligence in humans is that we have these prediction engines in us and they're always predicting what's going to happen next. And we can make this clear image going back to the map. And because our image of this idea is so clear, it seems true and we believe it. And as I say, when things are close in time and space, uh, this makes good sense. But when you get into the ether of trading something that's that's little movements on a screen if you will and other things then we get deceived well, hold on, Charles, are, spe- you telling, are you telling me that looking at a diversified futures portfolio in 2012 is different than the ox cart barreling down on you a thousand years ago <laughs> you're saying there's a slight difference and we can't go back to all those those visceral human ways that we used to handle the ox cart well i'm saying we can't not utilize those human ways we used to handle the ox cart and so you need to find a way to frame them and contain them and when you talk about ed sakota and and people who talk about you know being in the now that it's to treat the stories more lightly i mean ed first time he said this i just scratched my head and he said the following is somebody was asking him about uh i don't know what it was at the time it might have been uh copper or something and he said this commodity has the property of going up and they they ask him again and i and i now realize that they all wanted ed to tell them the story of why this was going to happen why it was happening why it would happen and Ed again repeated himself and says, this commodity has the property of going up. In other words, he freely confined his language to the moment of now. It's just tough for people to accept when they're not exposed to it. I think it's when, the, the, <laughs> the, well, the hard thing, too, is that sometimes when you've been exposed to it for a long time, it becomes second nature. And, you, and I, act, I just don't allow my mind, I just don't even think or worry about some of these things that you might have when you're first exposed to it. And then the tricky part becomes how do you reach back and explain it to folks that maybe have not had a chance to experience that same aha moment that you've had? Yeah, I agree. And and another of the strategies, one that I've, I've picked up recently, is the idea that that, that com- full and complete picture you have of that future, if you've got a way to poke a hole in it. And uh, I think of that, the, the, the fellow that we met at a conference, uh, I believe his name was, was Samuel Abraham, is that right? Salem, Salem Abraham. Salem, yeah, is that he, he was saying, you know, then I think, what could kill me? What could get me? You know, what, and what he's trying to do is he's throwing into that image that he knows his brain can't not make and going, how could this not be so? You know, throw another picture up on the screen, throw another map up on the screen. Well, he's, he's, he's also looking at the probabilities, too. He's saying, what what could kill me? What are the odds of this happening? What are the odds of that happening? And trying to affix a number to it. And and that kind of leads me into one of the things I know you've been talking to uh, your students and clients about in the not to uh, recent past here is, is what is risk? And I'd love for you to maybe just kind of jump into that from your perspective, because, you know, people, you hear this word risk and, you know, people, you know, different people use it for different reasons. You'll see magazines, newspaper articles, TV, but risk is something that I think the the great traders put some definition to, and they and they 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 attempt to put numbers to it, even if they're inexact. There is a there's an attempt to measure risk, and not simply by saying risk is volatility or just a standard deviation. That it's it's something more than that. And and you mentioned Larry Hyde, and I think Larry Hyde's great explanation of risk was you know what can you control? Well, the only thing you can control is how much you can lose, and that's real risk. 
So I just let you run with anything. I know you've got some different views on risk and, and mm. what you've been teaching people. Well, I'll start out with a, a reference to authority which is to say that I uh, was looking over a talk by one of the senior risk people for one of the largest firms in the world giving a presentation internally. I was uh, given a pass to look at this. And he admitted in the talk that they don't know what risk is anymore. This is like trying to figure out what is it. So first of all, the fact that you can put a label on something, that's again that, that magic of the mind. It creates a certainty. Well, risk must be a thing. And this fellow went on and he says, well, no, risk is a process. And right there, of course, we're going to lose a number of our uh, listeners. So let me pull it back and start with what, where I come from is that risk is a feeling, an estimate, and a reality. And these are not the same thing. So if you make in your mind a triangle, this is a model, a map, by the way, and one point of the triangle is the feeling that you have of what's risky and not risky, and another point of the triangle is the estimate, and the other point of the triangle is the reality. 